as Mike Crispino said, a glorious afternoon in Oakland for baseball, and we're underway as Mike Moeller throws strike one to Derek Jeter. His numbers all in relief last year. It was the A's closer to start the season. He saved seven games early on. Good breaking ball there, misses. So if you like percentages and you're a Yankee fan, Mike Moeller has never won a major league start. He's only started ten times. Two and one. Last year in relief against the Yankees, the Moeller picked up a, a victory. He also picked up the save. Now remember, the A's only won three games against the Yankees <laughs> all year. It's good off-speed pitch. And Jeter's out in front. He's a four-pitch pitcher, a little bit like Andy Pettit. Obviously, has not had as much success. Fastball, cutter, curve, and a changeup. Really going to have to spot that fastball off the uh, heel and fouled at the plate. He is not an overpowering pitcher, so they should be able to put the ball in play, speaking of the Yankee hitters today. Yeah, it's the, he's the kind of left-hander that uh, you right-hand hitters, I say you because being a switch hitter, they, they're on the tap, top step of the dugout. They can't wait to get out there. You see Mike's marks as a starter in his career. He's had 98 relief appearances since the start, and a good start for Mike Moeller. As he strikes out Derek Jeter to start the ball game. Let's look at our starting lineups brought to you by McDonald's. After Derek Jeter, it'll be Charlie Hayes. He's to start at third base today. Bernie Williams, Cecil Fielder, Tino batting fifth, and Mark Witt with his first start. Paul O'Neill seventh. Jorge Posada bats eighth. And Pat Kelly is in the lineup today. First start since August of last year. Defensively, Giambi Young at Conseco, Brochus, Batista, Spezio, McGuire, Molina, and Muller on the mound, Conseco in right field. Between the years of 1994 and 96, he played only 12 games in the field. This is his second game in the field this year, or make it his third in the field this season. Charlie Hayes follows the cutter at the plate, and the original lineup that Art Howe had had Baroa in right field, and then at the last moment, it was changed again. I think Jose would like to show Art how that uh, he can play in the outfield. I think it was one of those courtesies, a uh, day game after a night game. Mm -hmm. Bowler works quickly, and it's a ball and a strike to Charlie Hayes, who will forever be etched in the memories of Yankee baseball fans catching the last out of last year's World Series in Game 6. Right center field and hit well, but Conseco drifts over and puts it away. Two down. You might notice the sunglasses on Jose Conseco in right field. Very bright here in Oakland during day games. Very high sky, not many clouds in the sky. That's just the trademark of the Bay Area. It can be very difficult for a right fielder. And... Uh, First-hand knowledge of that. It wasn't fun playing right field here. You talk about uh, Yankee Stadium on a beautiful spring day and what a beautiful spot it is to play baseball. And this one is uh, right there along with it. Here's Bernie hitting right-handed today. You see, the construction is all completed now. The stadium built more for football than baseball. Two and zero. Oh. Rough game in last uh, last night. From the left side of the plate, Bernie went 0 for 5 and grounded into a double play to end the ball game. 3-0. Steve Carsey, the starter last night for the A's, was very effective. I thought he pitched Bernie Williams better than any other Yankee hitter last night. Bernie had a couple of good swings, hit the ball hard into the double play, but that curveball strikeout was really a classic pitch. Four pitch walk, so Moeller. With two quick outs, walks Bernie Williams here with two down in the first, and that'll bring up Cecil Fielder. Joe Torre has flip-flopped. Tino Martinez and Cecil Fielder today with the left-hand pitcher on the mound. Big Daddy gets the hit out of the cleanup spot. Joe very open about the decision he made last night to keep David Weathers in the ballgame. And he said, it's just something I've got to find out early in the year who I have confidence in. He said, I don't want to make moves too quickly and show pitchers that I don't have any faith in. 
Moeller paying attention to Bernie Williams at first keeps him close. Mike Moeller's 28 years old. He's from Ron Gidry country down in Louisiana. These signs most of the time, Kenny, are sent in from the bench. You know, managers will have a pitcher throw over the first base to see how difficult it is for the runner to get back to the bat. And the more difficult time the runner has beating the throw over the first might be an indication that he will be going. And then the manager might send a sign to the catcher for the pitch out. So it's not the pitcher just throwing over for effect. He, he wants to see something. Manager wants to see something in that runner at first base. And that's the pitching coach Bob Cluck flashing the signs. Fastball and Cecil comes to it. I, I kind of, I like to go with the old Bruce Souter theory. Bruce was a teammate of mine in St. Louis, member of the 1982 World Champion Cardinals. He had a bad move. He said, if I got a bad move, I'm not going to show it to the opposition. There's the signals we were talking about that go into Izzy Molina. Just misses. If you got a lousy move, why tip the base runner up? And Mike Moeller does not hold runners on particularly well. I think a pitcher is much more effective when he varies his count. You know, hold it for one second, then hold it for five seconds, and try to disrupt the timing of the base runner. And find the strike zone now, and it's gone to three and one. Seven of the last eight pitches out of the zone. Well, he's trying to bury the ball in on the hands of Cecil. Some pitchers are more effective to one side of the plate than the other. They have problems coming either for the inside corner or the outside corner. Let's see, I, I think right now, I, I know they're concerned about Bernie Williams stealing, but for a pitcher who has not started in three years, he wants all of his focus on Cecil Fielder. So this is breaking up his concentration a little bit by paying so much attention to the base runner. I mean, there's two outs there. This is yeah. the final out if you work on it. Off-speed pitch, and he lost it. pitching carefully to Cecil Fielder, but even though he'll get to face a left-hand hitter now in Tino Martinez, through the first three games, Tino's up there at the top of the American League in most categories. Seven hits, three homers, seven RBIs, leads the league in total bases. Hitting 538. Another one of those uh, daylight saving shot <laughs> batting averages, right? <laughs> Moeller misses again. Ball one. That's right. Tonight's night, isn't yeah. it? We got to change those clocks. Spring ahead. Ball back. You got it. it. Yeah. One less hour of sleep. Rip, but right at McGuire. Another good swing by Tino, but Moeller and the Oakland A's get out of it. Yankees strand a pair, but Doc Gooden. Going to the mound for his first start of 1997. We're back at Oakland after this. Oh, baseball like you dreamed it would be. Green grass, sunshine, beautiful afternoon. Let's take a look at the McDonald's starting lineup in the Oakland Athletics. Tony Batista leads it off. Scott Brocious, Jose Canseco. Then Mark McGuire, Geronimo Barroa. He was perfect last night, three for three. Jason Giambi with the game-winning home run. He bats sixth. And Ernie Young, Scott Spezio. And Izzy Molina bats ninth. Defensively, behind Doc Gooden in the field for the Yankees, Mark Whitten in left field getting a start. Bernie Williams in center, Paul O'Neill in right. Charlie Hayes getting his first start at third base. Derek Jeter at short. Pat Kelly at second today. Mariano Duncan getting the day off. Tino Martinez at first. Jorge Posada at short. Doc Gooden on the mound. There's a look at Charlie Hayes. Wade Boggs gets the afternoon off against the left-hander. And Doc Gooden's first pitch of the 1997 season in for a strike. No surprise the way he threw the ball over the plate in spring training. Outside, one and one. Last year, about this time, was when Mel Stottlemyre tweaked that motion and got him to take the ball out of the glove a little bit quicker. Right up the middle, and Batista has a leadoff single. the key in pitching and that pitch was in the middle of the plate. 
I've heard you say he centered it, and that's what he did. Yeah. Which is still a pretty good philosophy the first time through the batting order. I think the percentages are better. Branch Rickey used to say throw strikes for five innings and low strikes for four more. Yeah. <laughs> Here's Scott Brocious. Shows butt. That's the uh, versatility of Scott Brocious. Missed 47 games last year, still hit 22 home runs, knocked in 71, but as a number two hole hitter, he's got enough speed he can drop down a bunt. The A's are not really known for their bunting. They, they're going with power ball out here. Seiko with McGuire and Geronimo Barroa. Quick foot, quick feet by Doc Gooden to keep Batista close. One thing the Yankee pitchers worked very hard on this spring, along with uh, Mel Stoudemire, Billy Connors down in Tampa. Worked with a lot of the pitchers on holding runners on a little better. You can see Doc almost sitting on that back leg. That's what a pitcher tries to do Detroit, they had to help himself unload the ball toward home plate just a little nine. faster. Nice pitch. There's a look at Mel Stoudemire. Holding the runners a lot closer will give the catchers more of an opportunity to throw them out. Swing oh, by Brocious. Yesterday. You see coaches with those stopwatches well, in the yeah, dugout. They're, they're timing the, the release time for pitchers. And if the release time gets too high, what that tells the coach is that uh, a runner will have a pretty good chance to steal a bag on you. Yeah, the, generally speaking, if you can from movement to mitt, from the time Doc Gooden moves his hands till it gets to the catcher's mitt, there's that crouch position. If you can get it there in, say, 1.3 or 1 1.4 seconds, most catchers throw the ball to second base in about two seconds. So that's 3.4. You're going to get just about every base runner doing that. An accurate throw will get yeah. the job done. Upstairs, Doc, as you might imagine, in the first start of the year, a little bit pumped up, and he's, he's rushing himself just a little bit right now. Maybe one reason for that added work on holding runners, 24 of 29 were successful against Doc last year in stealing and you see the difference in his earned run average tapped out toward good he will take the sure out at first base as batista moves up on the ground ball and that's the first out of the inning we're going to look at that last play and doc gooden bouncing off the mound looked like a slider didn't it off the end of the bat, Doc immediately, didn't even look at second. He knew he had no play. He throws the first for the out. Experienced pitcher on the mound. <laughs> the way Kitty would have done it. Yeah. Slow start by Conseco, 113. David Wells really pitched him well last night. A lot of fastballs right under the hands. He's 0 for his last 10. And that's what Gooden tries to do, ball one. That's why... I mean, look at the uh, look at the armor. That's all a part of a big league uniform these days. Yeah. Old Vaughn has one. I guarantee you, you never wore that stuff. No, but uh, I, I like that because it's color coordinated. Yeah. I mean, how did he, that puts an extra five pounds on your arms? <laughs> Inside corner, strike one. I look for one of these swings for Jose to say, "Okay, I've seen about ten pitches in there." I'm going to just bail and rip one down the line. You talked about it last night, or you try to do that occasionally to scare the pitcher out of that zone. Get him away from there. Get him back out over the plate where I like it. That one's too far inside, 2-1. Reunited with teammate Mark McGuire. Of course, Jose back in 1988 had that big 40-40 season right here in Oakland. 42 home runs and 40 stolen bases. Get on the handle, but pissed it out into center field. It's going to fall in. Batista's being waved home. And the throw offline, but Gooden is backing up the play, so... And Seiko will hold his ground, and the A's take an early lead. I don't think Doc got this pitch quite in far enough. 
can see that it's a little bit out over the plate. Kateko still didn't have his best swing, but strong enough to line it into center field for a run scoring base hit. Bernie Williams getting the throw towards the direction of home plate, cut off by Tino, and the throw it wouldn't have been in time, but Tista takes out Posada at the plate. So Kateko picks up his first RBI of the season. And here's McGuire. Now those pitch you see Jorge Posada is saying calm down most of the time when the pitches are up and in like that that's an indication the pitcher is rushing himself just a little too much striding toward home plate quicker than normal toward third he's to Kelly and the nice pivot so after the RBI single by Conseco, Doc Gooden comes right back and gets McGuire to hit into an inning-ending double play. Played one at Oakland just like last night. The A's take the early lead. By your Tri-State GMC dealers comfortably in command pitchers in last night's game and the pitchers in the early part of this one they are comfortably in command Doc Gooden with two strikeouts to end the second inning and a Mike Moeller even though he's walked a couple of men is yet to allow a Yankee hit or a run Jeter chases the high pitch strike one Peter had a good night last night Got on base four times, a double, a single, a triple, a run scored, and a walk. Low for a ball. I asked him during the uh, stretching drills down there in the field, I said, hey, is that, that extra 15 pounds you put on, is that how you drove that triple to the wall in right center? Plus he, now you could tell me about this as a hitter. He's added one out. In other words, he swung about a 32 ounce bat. This year it's a 33. Fouls that out of play, and it's two and two. That doesn't seem like it would make that much difference, but it must. Yeah, it, it does. I think the heavier the bat you could swing, the better. Because uh, once you make contact with a good fastball, it's going to make the ball carry a little bit more. But it seems like everybody's going to the lighter bats for yeah. bat speed. Good pitch by Moeller, and it's poked out behind the mound, and Tony Batista cannot handle it. And Derek Jeter will reach first base. We'll see if it's a hit or an error. It's a play that looked like he should have made. This is going to go as a base hit. Now watch this ball go down. It looked like it was going to be a high chopper over the mound. But once right here, the ball stays down and it makes the play tougher for Batista. And that's when he bobbled it. Watch the hustle of Jeter. Smell a base Ooh, hit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish I could run like that. And then quick look up at the scoreboard to make sure they did score it an error. That would have had 200 more hits. <laughs> at least. So Jeter with the first Yankee hit reaches here in the top of the third. Charlie Hayes will step in. Looking for his first hit. Chopped fouled on the third baseline. Now you notice the face guard worn by Charlie Hayes. And Charlie would be kind enough to turn his head right here. Face guard right there. That's courtesy of Solomon Torres. Mm -hmm. When he was with the Colorado Rockies, uh, Charlie was hit by a pitch. Torres was with the... Uh, Giants at the time, and it fractured his jaw. And Charlie was incensed that he was trying to get out to the mound to get to Torres. There was bad blood between the two teams. The manager Don Baylor of the Rockies had a hammerlock on Charlie, wouldn't let him go. I mean, imagine if you go out there with a broken jaw, get hit again. Yeah, it's and they can do that. Trainers and the cap companies do such a good job of being able to shape that protective piece so it really doesn't affect his vision. Ironically, the uh, Yankees were just in Seattle, and that's where Solomon Torres is pitching now. He came in and appeared in that 16-2 blowout Yankee win on Wednesday. Bowler with the token toss to first. Good example of the Yankee depth on their roster. When you can sit Wade Boggs and be able to play a veteran like Charlie Hayes, Jeter's back again. I think what you're seeing, Ken, in the first few games of the season, 
by the opposition is early last year Joe Torre had the reputation of playing quote National League Baseball hit and run steal. Now these two teams didn't see each other in spring training obviously the Yankees trained in Tampa Florida and Oakland trains in Phoenix Arizona. But a carryover from last year I think they're looking for the Yankees to do a lot of running mm -hmm. and that's why you see high number of throws to first base. This is inside two and one. The once Darryl Strawberry and Cecil Fielder joined the Yankees. Then Joe's thinking changes yeah. a little bit. There's a little more power in the lineup. And also two hitters that swing and miss quite a bit. So you don't want to send the runners so much in front of them. Good point. As guys make contact. Didn't make contact on that off speed pitch. Off the count was two and two, but now it's two and two. Moeller's shown an excellent off speed pitch, keeping the Yankee hitters off balance. And the fastball has been in on the hand. So fastball in, change up, off speed pitch away. Speed up your bat, then throw that change, and hitters are off balance. Got him reaching there, off balance. And see, pitching nowadays, compared to what it was years ago, years ago it was high and low. Most guys were high ball hitters. They just said, hey, keep the ball down. I mentioned a while ago Branch Rickey's philosophy. Low strikes for five innings and low strikes for four more. Much more important nowadays Something going on here in the A's dugout. They think that maybe Jeter might be on the run. Much more important to pitch in and out. And I think that's because the strike zone has changed. It has flattened out. It's not as high as it used to be. Can't get that high strike. Who's giving the real sign? <laughs> One decoy, I'll tell you. That's 90s baseball right there. Look, a decoy and a real sign. Uh huh. Now the count is run full to Charlie Hayes. Now the reason they do that is so the opposition, there's Yankees, you know, Joe Torre or uh, Don Zimmer sitting in the dugout watching somebody give the sign. Now if you figure out a pattern, if only one person gives the sign, you got him. Jeter's on the run and it's grounded into the hole. Derek will make the turn but hold at second and Charlie Hayes picks up his first hit of the year. So back-to-back -back singles by Jeter and Hayes will bring up Bernie Williams. Last year, Bernie, I mean, he sparkled at just about everything, but particularly in this ballpark, check out these catches. Two days in a row, and of course, two of those were in the David Cohn comeback game when he held the Oakland A's hitless. through seven innings. Two on, nobody out. Off-speed pitch in for a strike. The Yankees had two on in the first inning, but there were two outs at the time. So this is their best scoring opportunity thus far in the ballgame. And a good setup for the Yankees a good matchup because Bernie as most of you know a much better right hand hitter than he is left hand they're off speed pitch just watching him in the batter's box tells you that uh, he's off to a little bit of a slow start you see a lot of early movement like he's anxious to mm -hmm. get to the ball sharply in the hole. That's in for a single. Jeter's going to score. Hayes will stop at second. We're tied at one. The three well-placed ground balls by the Yankees in this inning add up to one run in, two on, nobody out. Bernie with his second RBI of the year, and uh, Charlie Hayes, Bernie Williams with that hole between short and third have it zeroed in. Perfectly placed between the Third baseman Brochus and the shortstop Batista. They look like the 7 10 split there as they both trying to go after that ball. Follow through by Bernie Williams on the swing. And a bit of a smile over at the bag at first base. Well, the total's now even. And here's Cecil. The pattern continues. Fastball inside, and that misses ball one. Two and zero. Oh. 
Cecil's got himself a count where he can uh, really pick and choose. And from a pitcher standpoint, you got to be worried. You know, you got to throw a strike sometime. And we talked last night about these situations where hitters draw that little bitty box. Oop, that one wasn't in it. And uh, hearing Wade Boggs inter interview with Susan Waldman, who will be joining us here in the fourth inning. Uh, the players nowadays use the term keyhole. I'm going to keyhole you. It's like peeking <laughs> through a keyhole, and if it's not in that keyhole, I'm not going to swing at it. That is Wade, who got his 2700th hit last night. Taking all the way, three and one. Well, Cecil in that same situation as he was two and oh. If he gets that same pitch he got this last, he's going to thunder on it. Well, didn't get it. And Moeller misses the zone again. The Yankees had an opportunity here to really blow things open in the top of the third. Bob Cluck will make a trip to the mound. Be interesting, Ken, when the Yankees return home, they play eight games on the road and then open the season. And uh, the reception that Yankee fans will have for Cecil Fielder, because most of the focus this spring was on his contract yeah. situation. And uh, he finally got that behind him. But, but most of the fan reaction in New York was not favorable with, uh, you know, here's a guy who played on a World Series winner, got to come over from a last place club, the highest paid Yankee in franchise history. And he didn't appear to be happy with that. And, uh, New York fans pay pretty close attention to things. It went right down to the wire, didn't yeah. it? Whether he wanted to be traded or not. Yeah, the Yankees have the right man in the right spot. Tino Martinez. That's him for a strike. You know, he, he hit three home runs in his first three at-bats Wednesday in Seattle and then came up three more times with the bases loaded with a chance to hit another one. Off the plate, one and one. He could have homered for the cycle. He would have been the first to ever do that. A solo, a two, a three, and a grand salami. Moeller is out of sync His right control now. has deserted him at a most inopportune time. Still nobody up in the bullpen. So they hadn't made the call yet. Count is two and one. Down into left center field fairly well, but Giambi's going to drift over and make the grab. Hayes will tag and score. And the other runners will hold. So the sacrifice fly by Tino gives the Yankees a two to one lead. Tino, not a dead pull hitter. Using all the field, gets a high breaking ball out over the plate, drives it towards the gap in left center field. Didn't quite get on top of it. Ball kind of hung up in the air for Giambi to run underneath it to make the catch, but the Yankees still get a run out of it. And here's Mark Witten. Out in front of that off-speed pitch and pulls that foul. Tino now in the early going, depending on what uh, Melvin Nieves did in Chicago, where the uh, White Sox and Tigers are in a high-scoring affair. Nieves of the Tigers also has seven RBIs, and that one was Tino's eighth of the year. One and one to Witten. Nice block by Molina. Hasn't had many bad swings through these first four games, Tino Martinez. If you're a hitter on his team, you want to sit next to him. Hopefully yeah, some help. of that rub off on you. Ground foul. It's two and two. One of the discussions near the end of spring training, there appeared to be three players on the bubble, Tim Raines, Pat Kelly, and Mark Witten. Tim Raines made that decision easy for the Yankees because he went on the disabled list with a slightly strained hamstring, but he's about ready to play. There's the inside target. Moeller 
He's trying to make those perfect 4th of July pitches right now. And sooner or later, against a disciplined ball club like the Yankees, you have got to trust your stuff, make them put it in play. Runners on the move, and Witten fouls out at the plate. Uh, I think that's a key point. The fact that the Yankee hitters are veteran hitters, they'll make you work. They'll make you throw that strike. Even if you make a perfect pitch with a strike, if, you don't, if they don't have two strikes, they're going to take it. They're not going to get themselves out. Joe Torre with the runners on the move, trying to stay out of the double play. Trying to build more of an inning here as the Yankees have scored twice. And runners on the go again. Witten fouls it off once more. Yeah, that's how this lineup the last couple of years with so many veterans in it like Boggs and O'Neill. Derek Jeter as a young player shown good discipline. They will make a starting pitcher work to the point where most managers have to make a change in the fifth or sixth inning. They just, pitchers just throw too many pitches. O'Neill waiting on deck. The uh, A's try to trick Bernie Williams. That's not going to fly. On the goal. And again, Witten out in front, fouls this down the left field line. That uh, is going to reach the seats. Three singles to lead off the inning. And Bernie Williams got the third of those three to get the Yankees on the board. And then Cecil drew a walk. See Cecil and Mark uh, McGuire speaking. That <laughs> getting a workout running yeah. down in second. Got to hope they don't collide. <laughs> oh, man. Again, Witten stays alive. Now Cecil and Bernie Williams, they're getting their running in. Yeah. It's, a, it's an in-game weight loss program. He's now got uh, five sprints under his belt. Going again, and Witten with a good at bat. Fouled off the bad ones and then uh, took the borderline pitch and once again the Yankees have them loaded. That's the fourth walk allowed by Moeller. Walked two men in the first and got away with it. But uh, this particular inning, let's check out the sequence. There's a foul ball out of play. Low and inside. Another pitch low, another off-speed pitch. Hit well, right field, Canseco back, looking up, and Paul O'Neill has a grand slam home run. Oh, those base on balls will catch up with you. And they caught up with Mike Moeller. What a start Paul O'Neill is off to. The Yankees lead at 6-1. to one. felt that the pitch following a walk to load the bases, that first pitch is going to be there, tried to trick him with a breaking ball. He did. Didn't work. So put that in that uh, column again of more home runs hit off bad breaking balls than any other pitch, and there was an example. Boy, is he off to a great start. Well, Sava can't come to the plate. Uh, he can't get the donut off of his back. <laughs> There you go. All right. Too much pine tar. That was Paul O'Neill's third career grand slam. So six runs on just four hits because of all the base on balls. And now Jorge Posada will step in. And first pitch, ball one. Two and oh. Right field, fairly deep. Canseco's there. And he puts it away. Two down. You have talked about uh, the Oakland 
bullpen. Now they're going to get ready, Kenny, but I think one of the reasons that uh, Art Howe waited such a long time, it's Moeller's first start in three years, and if he's going to be a part of the starting rotation, they're going to allow him to stretch out. Yeah, air yeah. it out a little bit. Pat Kelly, curveball. This is for a ball. Ninth man to hit this inning for the Yankees. They batted around. Good fastball there. One and one. Two and one. Pat Kelly spent some time playing in Australia, which is uh, where his wife Rebecca is from, and also played some winter baseball down in the, uh, I believe in Puerto Rico, just to try to get some game time in. Dribbled out towards second. Scott Spezio makes the pick and the throw in time. Paul O'Neill with the big blow, his third career grand slammer, and the Yankees erupt here in the top of the third for a six spot. Do it right away. We're going to the bottom of the third. Doc Gooden and the Yankees have a five-run lead. Sunday. New York Yankee baseball is brought to you in part by Nobody Beats the Wiz Home Entertainment Centers. Great afternoon in Oakland and Doc Gooden. Now has a five-run lead to work with as we go to the bottom of the third. First pitch swinging. Izzy Molina chops it toward short. Jeter makes the play and the throw in time. One down. It's always a nice feeling for a pitcher. You get a six spot in the third inning. And what you hope for is to have the opposition go down quickly. And there's a one pitch out. Tony Batista, as he did last night, he let off the ball game with a double and scored a run, and today with a single and did that. Takes high for a ball. Fourth inning, uh, Susan Waldman, who did that nice feature on Wade Boggs that uh, was on our AT&T Yankee scorecard, will join us. It's in for a strike, and uh, we'll kind of rehash the week, the first week of the season for the Yankees. Some of the highlights. Oops. <laughs> we both saw it coming, didn't we? <laughs> Catches Batista on the shoulder. Well, the wind up, the target is inside. The trouble is the pitch is a little bit too far inside. Up off the shoulder. Batista getting a good look at this one. Watch him turn that head. Ooh. You got to get that coconut out of the way. <laughs> like Doc hung on to that, maybe held it just a little too tightly. So Batista reaches with one out here in the third. Here's Scott Brocious. All kinds of terms. Is that like choking in a... Yeah, a little bit. You know, where you, uh, you love to feel the ball come off your fingers uh -huh. very lightly, almost like it just, just flies out. Batista's on the go. And uh, Posada's throw into center field. Tony thought about going to third and then held up. Now there is a, a little change in the style of baseball. Usually when you have a powerful team like Oakland, you'll sit back and wait for the home run. Art Howe didn't do it. Maybe that was a revenge steal after being hit by a pitch. I'm going to go. Here's a good pitch to uh, throw by Posada, but uh, Batista had too good a jump off good. He was gone on first move, not expecting Doc to throw over with a five-run lead. And he's on his way to second. Ah, I'm going to hold right here. Not really a bad approach by Art Howe. You're down five, and with one out here, if you could steal a base and peck away and get one or two, then with those long ball hitters, you have a shot at getting back in the ball game. up and in. it almost looks from that center field shot that Doc is trying to make the ball move inside to a right hand almost like he's throwing it inside out and pushing it it doesn't appear that to be that good overhand free here it is I think he's trying to follow the game plan that uh, David Wells showed us last night maybe for the Yankee pitchers throughout this series it well left
left field. Witten near the track. It's going to stay in the ballpark. Sounded a little better than that, but Brocious just got under it, and that's a big second out for the Yankees. Take a look at Doc and, and his delivery. Here's the setup. Weight on the back leg. Swings and fires. Good leg drive from Gooden. As you said, the legs are just as important as your arm in throwing a pitch to the plate. You have to have that good push off the mound, give you that impetus towards home plate, give you that 90 mile per hour yeah. fastball. He may need it here against uh, Conseco. Goes to the curveball and hangs high. Conseco now, when you think back to last night's game, has seen a lot of pitches on the inside half of the plate. We haven't seen him try to turn and pull one yet. Is that leg action you were referring to, Kent? That's why those pitchers do all that running in between starts. The pitcher says, or most pitchers say, their easiest day is the day that they pitch. In between starts, they lift a lot of weights, they do sure. a lot of running to prepare for their start. Yeah, pitching's like a day off from a workout standpoint. <laughs> That's a good curveball in for a strike, and it's one and one. Yeah, Jose got, got a base hit, drove in a run in the first inning, but uh, that broke an 0 for 10. So he's not quite out of the woods yet. It seems like they go wild and make great pitches. Every single pitch right on the corner. Good curveball. That's ripped down in the corner and gone. Wow. I mean, that got out in a hurry. That looked just like a little line drive single, and Conseco rips it into the left field stands, and the A's are within three. That was not good and best curveball. This one kind of hangs. Kind of up in the eyes for Conseco out over the plate. Got his arms extended. And that's the danger of getting the ball out over the plate to a hitter like Conseco. The Yankees have been trying to pound him in. That one was not in. And the A's have two more runs. And Jose has his first home run as an Oakland Athletic since he left here in the early 90s. McGuire takes the curveball. That misses for a ball. Sada calling for a lot of hooks now. There's a look at the swing. Mm, great extension. Yeah, it had that sound. Doc Good knew immediately. Last ball misses two and one. Yeah, you can hit 10, 8, 9, 10 home runs in spring training until you hit that first one during the season. this year Jose had 328 career home runs Mark McGuire his teammate had one more than that so they're gonna have a nice battle all year long Mark has one already this year so he is sitting on 330 it's an inside curveball that McGuire swings through so Doc with another strikeout in the third Kenny I'll see you at the top of the seventh Susan Waldman will join me in the fourth, Doc disgusted with the pitch to Conseco, but after three, the Yankees still lead it, six to three. Part by Hoover. Nobody gets the dirt like Hoover. Nobody. Jim Conn, along with Susan Waldman, as we go to the bottom of the fourth inning, the Yankees lead this one six to three behind Doc Gooden, trying to even their record at two and two. Keep an eye on Doc's motion this inning, Susan, and see if we can pick up what you were talking about favoring that uh, favoring that leg. That pitch to Baroa misses for a ball. See, and it's missing in the same spot. It's going up and in, and that's what they're watching for. Good curveball, ripped to deep left, and Baroa continues his assault on Yankee pitching. That's gone. His third of the year. Six to four, Yankees. Now here's that.
that pitch and in the same spot again, up and in. The curve doesn't break, hangs out over the plate, and Barrow just turns on it and smacks it into the left field stands. And he just kills this team. And I was going to say, before he hit that homer, Kitty, that uh, uh, yesterday was the first game that he hadn't had a home run in since the season started, and now he's got his uh, today. Uh, Giambi will step in. That's what it looks like on supervision. They were right up, curveball didn't drop. Off-speed pitch. Now, Doc's going to a lot of off-speed pitches after the... Uh, well, the Conseco home run was on a curve. Hits are now even at five apiece. That's good fastball, but it misses, two and one. Now, with that left leg, Kitty, that's his landing leg, and mm -hmm. so that's got to hurt him every time he lands on that leg. What does that do to his motion? Well, if it does hurt him, obviously it affects the... the talking before the game, Mel Stottlemyre did not think it was going to bother and there's a sort of a lazy breaking ball that catches the outside corner two and two I think a, a lot of it is just your first start of the year you're usually a little bit over pumped and uh, I noticed in the first inning he's rushing his motion a little bit tend to overthrow the ball it's good curveball fouled out of play that's why managers and we saw it how do it today they will go a little deeper into the game with a pitcher the first start just to try to get some innings under his belt hope that he gets his rhythm that wind up out of the glove no ill effects that uh, you can pick up just by watching his motion it has looked completely normal squibbed out toward the mound doc will make the bare hand pick and the toss to tino is in time first out of the fourth inning you know you're talking about being over pumped david Cohn, perfect example of that the first night in seattle was talking about it after the game he couldn't calm down he was very nervous very excited just couldn't get in sync you've been in spring training for a couple of months and you, you look forward to your first start of the year and that uh, no matter how many years of experience you have that's something that all all pitchers have to deal with ernie young a strikeout victim in the second inning there there's the pitch that i noticed the one that that ball that is is kind of tailing it's almost like doc is trying to make the ball move inside to right hand hitters that's not his normal over the top fastball. Watch how he almost pushes this ball to the inside. Right center field. Paul O'Neill drifts over and he'll make the grab. Two down. Doc in spring training had the best ratio of any major league pitcher. 20 to 1 strikeouts to walks. I mean his control was absolutely perfect. But as we say, spring training's overrated. Nobody really cares too much about that once the season starts. Here's Scott Spezio, follows that out of play. They have a lot of hopes for this kid, talking to uh, Oakland staff about Scott Spezio. Young switch hitter, very intense. They were comparing him not in talent-wise, but in makeup to Pete Rose. Well, for a ball, his dad, Ed, had the reputation of of holding out even with his minor league contracts. <laughs> I think that's where Scott picked a lot of his uh, hard-nosed attitude up from. Off-speed pitch to Spezio's two and one. Take a look at our in-game box score with the Oakland Athletics lineup. Conseco a perfect two for two, and Barroa, no surprise what he does against the Yankees. Hit well, right center field. Bernie's on the run, he's looking up, and it hops over the fence for a home run. Scott Spezio with his first home run of the season makes it a one-run ball game. Spezio's got an awful lot of power and you've got to stay out of the zone with that. He'll strike out a lot, but when he gets a hold of one, it'll go a long way. Was a third baseman and hits like a third baseman. Right over the middle of the plate, 
it in about knee high, thigh high, and Spezio just wrapped it over the 400 mark sign. How about mm. that? I mean, you got to be pretty accurate. He hit the top of that fence. <laughs> he did. Hit the top of the fence and it bounced over. And pitched to Molina and for a strike, as Ken Singleton mentioned in the early part of the ball game. Scott's dad, Ed, started him as a switch hitter when he's three or four years old. <laughs> He wanted him to be a switch hitter. Never played second base before this year. Another curveball again that Doc has gone to. There's Brian Bowringer warming up. Had an afternoon where it uh, looked like it could be a comfortable game for Doc Gooden with a 6-1 lead. And in Oakland this year, and all the publicity in the Bay Area is about the Oakland baseball team. You read very little or hear very little about the Giants. And the slogan here is Powerball. Out toward third, nice play by Hayes, and just gets Molina by a half a step. Nice play by Charlie Hayes, showing you his range to his left. Doc Good and the Yankees still hanging on to a one-run lead as we go to the fifth. of tonight's game, we now fast forward on Yankees Rewind. Welcome back to Oakland, a close one. Brian Boehringer pitched out of that jam and kept it a one-run ball game. Ken Singleton now rejoins me here as we go to the top of the seventh inning, and uh, Doc Gooden's control was pretty good, just one walk. How did you assess his performance? Well, I thought he threw pretty well. Uh, six hits at five runs and five and two-thirds inning, 77 pitches. Maybe a little bit of problem with location on the home run balls, but outside of that, I think Doc uh, had a pretty good uh, debut. Yeah, it's like real estate. Location, <laughs> location, location. If you don't throw it hard enough to throw it past them all you better put it in good spots buddy groom put that in a good spot right on the outside corner to tino martinez he is the fourth oakland pitcher check that the third oakland pitcher and tino grounds this out towards second base where spezio makes the play one down at the top of the seventh see my bud don wenger did a pretty good job of shutting down the yankees Three strong innings, only a couple of hits. That's what you want from your middle relief. If, if your starter can't get the job done, you want that middle relief guy to kind of calm things down, give your team a chance to get back in the ball game. And that's a good point. That's exactly what he did in three innings. Allowed this team to get back in it. Here's Witten. That's inside for a ball. Buddy Groom, once a top prospect with the Detroit Tigers. He had him... Uh, Figured to be one of their starters for quite a while. That didn't work out. And he also pitched for the Marlins. Baggers are still looking for starters, aren't they? Mm, they better after today. I mean, they're winning 15 to 12 in the ninth inning. <laughs> That's good fastball into Whitten. That sounds like a score you might hear in November or December. Huh? Yeah. I think we're going to hear a lot of them in during the baseball season this year. There's still going on in Chicago, 15 to 12. You see Milwaukee, a 5-2 winner over Toronto at Sky Dome. Two and two to Witten. Got him on a high blazer. Take a look at our MCS Cannon turning point of the game. No surprise. Bases loaded. First pitch. Hanging breaking ball. Well, they go a long way Ooh. when you get the wood on them. Now that one is squirted down the left field line and just foul. We talked about it the first couple games of the season, and today's good indication. Barroa's home run, curveball. Conseco's curveball. O'Neill's curveball. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can't throw them, but there are so many mistakes made with the breaking ball. And it almost looks to me that hitters are becoming better breaking ball hitters today. They see 
so many of them, and you, you don't see as many hard throwers. Now, I think maybe particularly early in the season here where pitchers might not be as sharp with that breaking ball as they would like. I mean, we're just out of spring training. Just missed with that one. Well, and particularly in the cooler weather that we're mm -hmm. going to see, you don't quite get that feel for the ball that you might like, and Flabble will throw a few spinners up there. Not that sharp breaking hook that you'll see in July and August. Up and in, you played with a left-hander who was a great example of that. Crazy horse, Mike Cuellar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he would struggle in April and May. Looked like he'd be about ready to be released. And all of a sudden, in September, he's got 20 wins. <laughs> oh, again, O'Neill fouls that out of play. With the breaking ball pitchers, usually things get going for them when the weather heats up. Nice crowd today. And heard the official announcement, but uh, it, I would think in the uh, 25,000 neighborhood. Well, they have gotten their Powerball show. Three home runs by the A's and a grand slam by Paul O'Neill of the Yankees. And he's worked the count full here against Buddy Groom. It's that time of the afternoon with the shades down. And O'Neill draws a walk. Oh, he keeps the inning alive for the Yankees. We'll look at our in-game box score. Jeter and Hayes with multi-hit games. And O'Neill with just one, but he knocked in four with one swing. Checking Conseco out there with the glasses down. Now, earlier in the game, we had what you call the high sky, and then this time of the afternoon, it's a little tougher to play right field. Yeah, the... Uh... Asada slaps this into right field, and... O'Neill will make the turn, and he's headed for third. Nice alert base running by Paul O'Neill. The Yankees have runners at the corners here with two out in the seventh. Posada using that hole on the right side, O'Neill being held on. Used to be some good right-handed hitters. Bobby Richardson years ago with the Yankees used to be able to slap the ball through that oh. open hole and move that runner to third base as we watch. Paul O'Neill. He's motoring. First I mean, and third, no, yeah. No sign of any kind of a hamstring problem there. So it's a little tougher right now picking up the ball in right field. Yeah. Um, I, I like the way everybody says, well, the sun has moved. Actually, it's the earth that has moved. <laughs> and uh, the earth moving uh, this time of afternoon in right field can be difficult. And even for a center fielder, moving over towards the gap in right center. That shot down in the Oakland bullpen was Richie Lewis, the veteran right-hander. And I think Bob Cluck wants to buy a little time to get him ready. Now remember, the Yankees still have Wade Boggs on the bench if mm -hmm. he brings that right-hander in. And Mariano Duncan's still there, so they can use him defensively. Well, I think this is more or less a uh, standing eight count for Buddy Groom here in the... Uh, seventh inning. Yeah, Art Howe usually makes the pitching changes, the manager. So whether uh, that's exactly what Cluck is out there just to buy a little time and I think one of the other things Ken, the situation that's come up right here is if with first and third and two out, Posada would decide to take off for second base and trick the Oakland A's into a double steal, Cluck wanted to make sure that everyone knew where to throw the ball and what the A's were going to do. Inside, ball one. Billy Martin loved this situation. What he'd do here with Posada is he'd have him take about five steps off the bag and then fall down <laughs> to get the attention of the pitcher. This is grounded towards short in a hole. Batista, nice play, and the toss to Spezio in time. Boy, the... The young Keystone combination of the athletics has been impressive here in these two games. Batista and Spezio, they bailed Groom out of trouble. Six and a half. Yankees still clinging to the lead by one. Back at Oakland on a beautiful afternoon. And a reminder that New York Yankee baseball is brought to you in part by American Express. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, American Express helps you do more. Jim Cott along with Ken Singleton as we move to the bottom of the seventh. And Scott Spezio leads it off against Brian Bowringer. On the 
the edge for a strike. All the action was early. The Yankees scored all six runs in the third inning. The A's got two in the third, two in the fourth. So the last few, Wingert and Buddy Groom have done a good job keeping Oakland in the game. It's Darryl Cousins, the third base umpire, says so no swing, and it's two and one to Spezio. Speed pitch pulled foul, two and two. Did you get any home runs like this? Top of the fence, bounced over? Uh, a grand slam. Wow. Yeah, my last major league home run. A grand slam hit the top of the fence at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. But this one, uh, you know, you take it, though. I think this young man has a chance to be a very impressive ball player. Not on that swing, though. The impressive pitch there by Brian Boehringer, and he gets a big strike out of Spezio to uh, lead off the Oakland seventh. So if my sports trivia memory serves me right, it's that little look, kind of a high slide. Yeah, it, it uh, looks like it didn't break as much as Spezio thought it would. First pitch to Molina and for a strike. That would have been home run number 246. Mm -hmm. Your last one as a major leaguer. This is what Brian Bowringer did so well last year. You know, he had a couple of chances to be a starter, and it didn't sit right with him. I mean, he was, he was a little uptight. He overthrew the ball. He was not effective. But coming out of the bullpen, this one's hit well out to right. O'Neal is on the run, makes a nice running grab. Again, reminiscent of the fine catch he made last year in Atlanta. He doesn't have the foot speed but with the long legs and the jump on the ball, he could still track them down. And you put positioning in there as well. Playing just about where the hitters are going to hit the ball. Uh, and being set up uh, by uh, Jose uh, Cardinal in the dugout. Paul O'Neill runs down many more balls than you would think he would in, in right field. And I gather that play not as easy it may have looked because uh, he just Paul looked up at the sky. And we've talked about it so this time of the day. A little tougher to track the ball out there. Here's Batista. Now, when he hit that ball at Tony Hayes, I said, there's Barroa. I mean, if this guy isn't a twin <laughs> in the way he swings for Geronimo Barroa, that's fouled out of play. And that right now, one of those not in the box scores is the great play that Charlie Hayes made to take a hit away from him in this one-run game was a big one. Got to remember, he was leading off the inning at the time. Got by with a high slider. Foul territory, and there's plenty of it here in Oakland. Charlie Hayes camps under it and puts it away. Another World Series memory. That was the last out of last year's series. Seven in the books. The pitchers have taken over. The Yankees still lead it by a run. We head to the top of the eighth. The Yankees lead it by a run. They scored all six of those in the top of the third. When we're done here, in Oakland, you'll be able to tune in to MSG and catch the Knicks and the Atlanta Hawks. Pre-game coverage begins at 7 o'clock. Actually, it begins with work done here with the MCS Cannon Knicks game night. That's tonight on the MSG network. We're all over it out here in Oakland as well as in Atlanta. Yeah, well, the Hawks are tough at home. Mookie Blaylock and Christian Layton. Layton threw in 30, I think it was last night or the night before. And it's getting down to the uh, last part of the season, those playoff berths at stake. You're looking at Richie Lewis, veteran right-hander with an outstanding curveball, who comes in to take over the pitching chores. And he'll face Derek Jeter. Pitched last year with the Tigers. Richie started his career with the Orioles, spent some time down in Florida. Jeter tries a bunt, bunts through it, strike one. It's out of Florida State University. back in Omaha in the College World Series. Richie got drafted back in uh, 87. Scouts already talking about that good curveball. It's high and it's one and one. a little low two and one to Jeter no already we see something unusual about Richie Lewis you don't uh, see too many pitchers out there on the mound with a rat tail do you no. <laughs> How about that a little different look out there 
in on the hands of Jeter just you know, <laughs> the hits just keep on coming he had three last night he's got three today and that's a big one because the Yankees lead it by a run and now Joe Torre has got some options Jeter's taking a look do I have the steal sign Jose Cardinal is going to come over and relay it to him Charlie Hayes can do a good job of hitting the ball the opposite way so the Yankees goal here will be to get Jeter into scoring position that time we seen a pitch out somewhere in this series this, this might be a good chance for it wild swing by Hayes strike one I always when you hear the word pitch out I think of Junior Ortiz and Tom Seaver and they were teammates with the Mets Seaver working a crossword puzzle and he said Junior a four letter word for clinched hand and Junior says peach out <laughs> the fist has always been the pitch out from the time Abner invented this game I think one and one four letters huh four letters <laughs> clenched hand this no peach out you're right we have not seen uh, we have not seen a pitch out yet this year they get Jeter with a stolen base today his second of the year and we're not going to see a pitch out here it looks like a fastball keeps Jeter close Richie Lewis out of Florida State where he was coached by Mike Martin longtime coach of the Florida State Seminoles played with Mike Martin in the minor leagues you did yeah he was an outfielder one attempt by Hayes I don't know if that was on his own you know, usually if it's a sacrifice situation you'll see a guy square uh-huh sometimes a veteran hitter Joe Torrey will say well veteran hitter like Hayes any way you could get him over take your pick <laughs> Look out for the Jeter. Now, teams will be looking out for him a little more this year because he showed last year what a solid player he was and is as the unanimous rookie of the year. Now Hayes or Lewis pitching uh, Hayes into account where the Yankees uh, can send the runner deeper they get into the count so if you're going to send him three and two which the Yankees should you should send them two sure. and two yeah Bernie waits on deck now the count is full now Jeter will be off yeah for sure see Charlie Hayes checking his sign from Willie Randolph just to make sure that the runner is going to be going so he doesn't have that distraction out of the corner of his eye He's being surprised to see Jeter take off from first base so he can concentrate on the pitch Jeter's on the move and Charlie Ooh. Hayes take that pitch way up and in almost hit him see that's why you don't want that distraction right so he draws a walk and the Yankees now with two on nobody out here in the top of the eighth and a chance to increase their lead take a look at the uh, nobody beats the whiz scoreboard around the American League Milwaukee a five to two winner Jamie McAndrew got the win and Gerald Williams former Yankee hit his first home run in that one there's the wild affair it's now over 15 to 12 Willie Blair got the win in that one that was Doug Trebek's first start in the White Sox uniform we'll see what Bernie Williams has done today Now the A's are looking bunt and they're not going to get it but McGuire is way in on the grass as Willie Randolph flashes the signs I think a couple of things Joe Torrey wants to get Bernie Williams on track hitting out of that three hole he feels that if Bernie pulls the ball he has a good chance to advance the runners anyway one and one and uh, left handed hitters advance base runners a little bit better than right handed hitters especially when they pull the ball to the right side Jeter's at second 
Got his third hit of the game. Then Charlie Hayes drew the walk. He's at first. Nope. That's one of those wish, you know, hope and wish. You make a move like that, hope the guy falls down or something. It? Giants beat the Mets two to nothing. And the Rockies, ooh, 15 runs against the Expos. They win it 15 3. I, Lewis can't find the strike zone. Billy Brewer, he pitched briefly for the Yankees last year. Did he check in time? Yes, he did. Darrell Cousins with the call, and well, Richie Lewis has gotten himself into a situation where he really has to throw a strike on this next pitch. There's the breaking ball. That was close, wasn't it? close but he held up in time and it didn't look like the intent were there sometimes that's those strong hands you can mm -hmm. hold the bat back so the situation keeps getting better for the Yankees as Richie Lewis cannot find the strike zone he's now a 3-1 count I would expect the runners would stay put here Cecil waits on deck and if it goes to three and two you'll see him on the run sharply and into right field Jeter is being waved home Hayes to third, and the Yankees lead it seven to five. Bernie Williams with his second RBI of the game. And Joe Torre wants to get him on track. That's the way to do it. Base hit in the right field scores Jeter. The Yankees pick up an insurance run here in the eighth inning. See where the pitch is. Target was outside. Pitch was towards the middle, and Bernie. Just jerked it right on in the right field for a base hit. You can see Canseco charging the ball. Grass seems to be heavy in the outfield. And here's where that last pitch was location. Middle, centered. Yeah. Right in the middle of the plate, 87 miles an hour. A good hitting pitch. That's in the red zone. Yeah. And left-hand hitters love that ball below the belt. Here's Cecil Fielder. And that one's inside. Seems like Every first pitch to Cecil Fielder today has been a fastball inside. They do not want to give him anything out over the plate. Para walks and he scored a run. Up and in, 2 and 0. Oh. Well, the Oakland Athletics with keeping their costs down. Hayes is at third after walking. And Bernie's at first with the RBI single. This is an area that really suffers is middle relief. You got pitchers that have been with other organizations, not particularly successful. Waves at the slider, and it's two and one. And I think what teams like this are just hoping to do, they can get some service out of Richie Lewis till some of their younger pitchers in their farm system develop. Richie Lewis made 72 appearances for the Tigers last year, went four and six. Bernie's on the run. This is hit well. Right center field. Canseco's on the move, and he's going to... Oh, he falls down, but he does make the catch. Hayes will trot home. Well, let's see now. No, we're... Uh, Canseco dropped the ball. The umpires are as confused as we are. There's the hanging slider. The ball hit the right field. Canseco loses his footing as he's making the catch. Now you have to have the ball under control and he drops the ball. Came right out of the glove. So Cecil is actually safe on this play and if they threw the second and got Bernie Williams he will be forced out. Cecil will get a sacrifice fly. Say goodbye <laughs> to Bernie Williams. He has been forced out at second and Cecil is safe at first. So he gets an RBI on a fielder's choice. Yeah. So by Canseco dropping the ball, it, ca it cost Cecil an at-bat. Would have been a sacrifice fly. But the news is still good for Yankee fans because they do pick up an extra run. 
Uh, you were we were talking last night. How long is this experiment going to last with Conseco in right field? And that might be an indication of how long it would right there. Here's another look at it. Cecil hits this ball fairly well, certainly deep enough for a sacrifice fly. Now watch the confusion here. He thinks he caught it. But he's still not sure. So just to recap that play, Conseco didn't have control of the ball. He threw it into second base. Bernie Williams forced it second. And Charlie Hayes scores on the play to make it an 8-5 ball game. And Oakland will make another pitching change as Richie Lewis leaves and Billy Brewer comes on. We'll be back at Oakland. The Yanks have now increased their lead to three. Back after this. Back at Oakland, Yankees lead it by three. Tino Martinez steps in against Billy Brewer. And the first pitch in for a strike. Getting Started good. his career with the Royals and uh, pitched briefly with the Yankees last year. Third of an inning early in the 1997 season. Grounded out toward third. Brocious, nice play to second for one. Not in time to first, but the A's get the lead runner. Cecil Fielder is forced at second. Well, here's knowledge of uh, who's on base because Brocious took a chance here. Had to kind of throw behind him across his body. Got Cecil at second. Uh, no chance to get the double play. But as you said, Jim, they got the lead runner. That'll bring up Mark Witten. And you're right about knowing who's running. I mean, so much of playing this game of baseball because it's a slow-paced game is anticipation. Mm -hmm. It moves slowly along, but when the ball's hit, you have to react quickly. Mark Witten takes the curveball high for a ball. Now Joe Torrey got what he wanted. He made some lineup changes today. Started Mark Witten. He started Pat Kelly at second base. Charlie Hayes at third. the dirt 2 and 0 oh, which is a day's rest for Boggs and Strawberry they should be back in there yep. tomorrow with the right hander on the mound Dave Tailgater the former Met low again this whole game, I, I get the impression that the Oakland pitching staff has spent so much time maybe in one of Art Howe's meetings. I used to call them scare the pitcher meetings. There's Mariano Rivera beginning to loosen. You could look for him to pitch the ninth. You go over hitters and talk about where you can't pitch him. Huh? You can't pitch him here. He can hit the change up. He can hit this pitch. Scare the pitcher meetings. And on the hands, yeah. Brocious tosses to Spezio in time. So Groom gets out of the inning, but the Yankees had a very important pair of runs. We head to the bottom of the eighth. Yankees lead it eight to five. Are you? Bottom of the eighth inning, the first pitch from Brian Bowringer is in for a strike to Scott Brocious. 0 for 3 in today's game. One and one. Let's take a look at our Sipperstein painting, a perfect match. Feature comparing Scott Brocious and Mike Blowers. To uh, similar periods of their career. This is lofted out into right field, and Paul O'Neill is there and makes the grab one down. So that feature comparing Scott Brocious and Mike Blowers. Well, the same periods of their careers was brought to you by Sipperstein, New, New Jersey's largest paint and wallpaper superstore. Scott, I think, a little better player in the field than Mike Flowers, but their offensive numbers very close. At this point in their career, certainly more upside to uh, Scott Rossi. Here's Conseco pitch up and in for a ball. We were talking about these pitchers meetings, and you have them before the game, and Everybody has a chance to give their input. And by the time they're done as a pitcher, you're saying, where can I pitch this guy? You can hit the slider, you can hit the change. Guy played winter ball with him, saw him hit a fastball. And, and, and you see the pitchers 
you know when they miss the strike zone as often as they do, they're really trying to make that perfect pitch. We saw just the opposite last night in Carse and Wells, where guys were, they were challenging the hitters a little bit more. Way up in the air to right field. Soho's back. O'Neill's going to make the call and the catch. Almost looked like he opened his stance up a little more on that swing. Well, if McGuire and myself stay healthy the entire year, if we can average 155 to 160 games, I think definitely we're going to win our division. That's Jose Canseco. Yeah. American well, it, it's, it's nice to think that way in terms of Canseco and McGuire. But those of you that followed the Yankees last year, Bo Ringer's first pitch to McGuire inside for a ball, you know the buzz phrase these days is put up numbers. Frank Thomas and Albert Bell could put up all the numbers they want. They scored 12 runs today in Chicago, but Detroit scored 15. <laughs> you better have somebody coming out of the bullpen because the pennants are one on that little clump of dirt in the middle of the diamond. Woo. Charlie Hayes never saw that. I mean, this is off the left field wall. It's going to be, well, it's going to be a double now because Witten bobbled it. That would have been a, a hard single down in the corner. And fortunately for Brian Bowringer and the Yankees, it never got airborne. Let's watch his last pitch. Oh, high up in the zone, but he turns on it. And a tomahawk that one into the corner. Witten with the uh, double dribble out there towards the wall. <laughs> he thinks he had a shot at him, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, he's upset. Well, he may have. I he's mean, when, when Mark Witten came up with the Blue Jays and they talked about his throwing arm, the two names that came up were Dave Winfield and Jesse Barfield. He used to call Jesse the Barfield rifle out there in right field. Long conference at the mound with two out. And you wonder now, Joe Torre said, I don't want to bring Rivera into any five out situation. But you wonder whether he would make a move here with two out. Obviously not, but he is giving Rivera a little more time to get ready should Giambi come up this way. Low for a ball. And then you get to that tying run situation. Maxag's going to make it right now. He wants to, and this is a smart move on Joe Torre's part. With Mariano Rivera expected to be the closer this year, you would like to bring him into a situation where he's got a three-run lead as opposed to waiting till the heat's really on uh -huh. with one run. So he's giving him a little margin for error if he were to make the move right here. It's like uh, giving him a chance to get a feel for the game. Right. You don't feel quite the pressure, and obviously there's going to be some pressure when you take over for a man who saved 50 of your 103 wins last year, John Wetland. Well, Stottlemyre discussing it in the dugout. Brian Boringer leaves. Mariano Rivera is ready. He'll come on to try to nail this one down for the Yankees. Back in Oakland after this. Due to the length of tonight's game, we now fast forward on Yankees Rewind. I come back to Oakland, you see a lot of empty seats out the uh, outfield stands. Yankees lead it by three, but they did have a crowd of 25,000 plus here. And when our game is finished, you'll be able to join the New York Knicks and the Atlantic Atlanta Hawks here on MSG. It's that action takes place down in Atlanta. We will go right from our game right to the Knicks pregame show. Billy Brewer to Paul O'Neill, and that's in for a strike. Well, Paul O'Neill with the one swing of the bat that turned this game around, the grand slammer. Paul's third in his career. Outside. I want to take this time to uh, pass along our best wishes to Gordon Bridge of Hughes Television. He's a big Yankee fan. And he's resting after a bypass operation and part of the technical crew that helps us get these games from the ballpark to your home. So we wish Gordon Bridge a speedy recovery. The 
Billy Brewer curveball. In for a strike, one and two. Like it might be getting a little tougher to see the ball around home plate at this time of the afternoon also. That's low, two and two. You got that shadow creeping up mm -hmm. behind home plate. Not quite there yet. There it is. Hit well left field. Giambi's on the run. And did he get? No, he's not going to get it. And O'Neill will have a double. And like Tino Martinez, he has not had a lot of bad swings through the first four games of this season. And using the whole field, this ball driven very well to left field. Here's Giambi with the what I like to call the double retrieve. <laughs> Going back on it and then has to chase it again. Well, Neil might have thought this one was leaving the yard, but this is just going to be a two base hit. You have to turn it on. He knows he had a sure double. Yeah, Jason Chiavi ran a little bit of a post pattern on that one. <laughs> so a chance again for the Yankees to increase their lead. Posada steps in and rips this into left field. O'Neill's going to be held at third. And the Yankees with runners on the corners, nobody out with a a little late thunder here. Two in the eighth and now trying to add to it in the ninth. The Yankees pounded out. Had a few hits last night. Swinging the bats well today. They have touched up every A's pitcher for at least one hit. Yeah, Don Winger did a nice job in the middle of the game keeping Oakland in the ball game, but now at the end between uh, Richie Lewis and now Billy Brewer, the Yankees are increasing their lead. Here's Soho. Low for a ball. Often, you know, you hear of guys that are good high ball hitters or good breaking ball hitters. The book on Luis Soho is he is a good sinking fastball hitter. <laughs> I mean, if you get a guy that can throw that ball down in the zone, he can slap it the other way, which is, I would expect the Yankees would like to see right now. No, he's going to pull it down the line, but that's hooking foul. Looks like he was looking for something to really lean on. It. Well, hitters just, uh, I mean, they lick their chops when you get the starters out of the ball game. No, they really can take advantage of the middle relief core on most pitching staff. That is very true, and it's going to become uh, even more apparent in expansion year yep. next year. Nice block by Molina. I was talking with Woody Woodward, the Mariners general manager, Seattle Mariners, about that very problem. Teams invest their money in, like in Seattle's case, their money is on the field and in a part of their starting rotation, but they can't afford to uh, to pay too deep a bench or too deep a bullpen like the Yankees have. Poke down the line and right. Conseco gives chase. Looks like he'll have room. And he makes the grab. Posada alertly advances to second as O'Neill scores. And Luis Soho pads the Yankee lead to 9-5. Long run for Jose Canseco, and uh, remember I talked about this son, but he reaches out in foul territory and makes the catch. Tries to wing it to second, but Posada heads up, tagged up, and moved into second in scoring position. Yeah, nice alert play. Not a bad catch by Canseco. Had a long way to run over in the corner on that one, fighting the uh, bright sun. Here's Jeter. That's him for a strike. Earlier in the game, Posada beat a relay to first base, and he showed me he has pretty good speed for a catcher. Ooh, catchers hate to hear that. Well, he, 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 he does, right. though. But you got to remember, he's a young catcher. Right. <laughs> so many of them come up. That's inside the Jeter that had speed in the early days. Remember Johnny Roseboro, the Dodgers, but all those deep knee bends behind the plate, that takes its toll. 
Joe Girardi, of course, stole 12 bases last year, led all catchers, and that's a, a Yankee record. Jeter swings to it. Getting back to the discussion with Woody Woodward, with the expansion and the lack of uh, pitching depth, there's only one solution, and that's shorten the games of seven innings. It's about the only way they're going to get around it. Pat Kelly taping up his uh, favorite bat. He started today's game. He joined us late. First start he's had since last August. Played the first half of this one. And then Daryl Strawberry came on to pinch hit for him. You're Pretty wondering why, he, why he's doing yeah, that. Yeah, why is he doing that? So, so he can get a better grip at the plate. You don't have to always use pine tar. Now, Joe Girardi was doing that the other day. He put a lot of tape right above the knob. Jeter chases the high slider so they can use it for a cushion. Now, Joe broke the Hammett bone. Jose Canseco, another example of a hitter that did that. That's that bone on the outside of your wrist. And when you make contact with the ball, it, it hits the knob of that bat right against your right against that bone down on the outside of your hand. And a lot of hitters tape it up for that reason, for a little cushion. Sliced in, it's off the glove of Mark McGuire down in the right field corner. Jeter's gonna hit for second and Posada scores. Make it a 10-5 game and a four hit game for Derek Jeter. Three last night. A double, a triple, and a single. Three singles. And a double today. Squirting by Mark McGuire down the right field line. Once it got by him, this was an easy extra base hit. Yankees pick up another run. Now, Jeter not only drove the Yankees' 10th run home as Posada scored, but uh, he drove most of the fine crowd here in Oakland as soon as that ball got to the outfield grass. I mean, they're heading for the parking lot. This has always been a great tailgating stadium. Fans get here early on a day game and cook out the parking lot. Here's Charlie Hayes. And the breaking ball misses. Charlie's had himself a good afternoon. Yeah, in games like this, you lose sight of the fact that the great play that he made in the middle of this ball game on Tony Batista back in the fifth inning was an important play in the ball game. Doc Gooden was wavering just a little bit the lead was down to one and uh, Charlie made a remarkable play at third base knocking the ball down and throwing Batista out up and in right here on MSG after our game is over we will uh, send you down to Atlanta and pick up the rest of the MCS Cannon Knicks game night, their pregame show, and then the Knicks and the Hawks. So Billy Brewer can't find the strike zone, and uh, when he does, the Yankees have been touching him up. When Jose Canseco, we showed you the quote a while ago, if he and McGuire stay healthy, playing 150 to 155 games, they can win the division if they had some pitching. An amazing statistic that uh, jumped out at me about these Oakland Athletics is that in 1990, when they had those uh, outstanding championship ball clubs, last year's team outscored the 1990 championship team by 128 runs. The difference then was they had Eckersley and Honeycutt, Todd Burns, and that pitch to Bernie low for a ball. Here's a little comparison if you want to know how important pitching is. You see the run scored last year and the run scored back in 1990. That's the differential. In 1990, they actually outscored the opponents by 163 runs, but again, it points out no matter how much offense you add, look at the difference in the quality starts, the earned run average, the bullpen. Pitching is where it's at, and that's a good example in comparing the Oakland Athletics from 1990 when they won a division, and last year when they hit a whole lot of home runs, scored runs, didn't win anything. If you can stop them, you don't have to yeah. score that many. 
The Yankees were a good example of that last year. That's in for a strike. Which is why they were able to beat the Atlanta Braves in the World Series. The Braves were that great starting staff. They actually outscored the Yankees overall in the World Series. But the Yankees won all the close games with the two guys in the bullpen, Rivera and Wetland. That's in for a strike. Jim, I've always thought the mark of a good ball club is how quickly they can bounce back from a tough loss. Now, last night's ball game was a tough loss, no doubt about it. Quick turnaround afternoon game today, and the Yankees come out here and score 10 runs. Yeah, it's almost like a short reliever. I remember you talking about that before the game. It's almost like a short reliever that has that blows a save the night before. He can't wait to get out there again. Mm -hmm. And then Joe Torrey's team with that tough loss last night comes right back today in uh, what was a, a close ball game till the last couple of innings and now they've increased their lead to five off speed pitch and Bernie Williams down on strikes second out of the inning afternoon game tomorrow take another look at that strike up well that's the best pitch that he made this whole inning good change up had Bernie out in front talked about all the pitches that Cecil's had to look at inside today. And there's an example of it. those are all the first pitches that have been thrown to Cecil Fielder today. Five of them. Now they change and that's quite a switch from the first five at bats. That was a change up from Billy Brewer. That was low and away. Sharply, but right at Batista. Playing him in perfect position to toss to Spezio in time. The Yankees pick up a pair in the top of the ninth. Increase their lead to 10 to 5. Mariano Rivera coming out to try to nail it down for the Yankees. Due to the length of tonight's game, we now fast forward on Yankees Rewind. in the seventh inning. Yeah, exactly. Here's Scott Spezio. High for a ball. Yeah, psychologically, this will be a different year for the Yankees. As you see, George Williams, a switch hitting catcher, loosening in the on-deck circle. Foul straight back, one and one. Every manager I've talked to mentions that in facing the Yankees that at least this year we think we have a chance because last year when he came in Mariano Rivera in the seventh and then Wetland it was as you said game over that's fouled straight back we touched on it at the beginning of the game today the Yankees last year when leading going into the eighth inning were 79 and one that's the best record of any team in the major leagues in 10 years Bezio stays alive. And the, uh, the important thing here also for the Yankees would be for Mariano to have a relatively stress-free ninth inning. Because uh, when you're the closer, you're expected to be able to go out to that mound at least two out of every three days. Uh -huh. Might be called on tomorrow. off the foot and that'll be ruled a foul ball in fact I can remember being on ball clubs and I'm sure you can too you're down like this and the other team has their closer in there and everybody says well let's at least take him out of tomorrow's game you know stir up uh, get a few base hits stir things up see a speezy old foul that off his foot yeah, speaking of stirring things up it's like dropping a brick on your leg just to did you wear one of those pads? One no, I, I no, I didn't wear one of those pads. But the, the only time I ever went on the DL is because I fouled the ball off my foot. And then you wore one after that. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Slow learner. <laughs> There's the Rivera fastball. That's the pitch so many American League hitters had to deal with last year. And that's the first out of the bottom of the ninth as Spezio's down on strikes. High octane gas. He really have to be have a quick bat to get up there and get this one. 
On by him for strike three. So the A's will make a change here. George Williams, uh, switch hitting catcher, Izzy Molina, started both of these games, and Williams will pinch hit. You see his numbers this year, three for five. He's late on that one. You mentioned catching up with that high octane, and I've always, I've always wondered for a hitter to explain it, and that's it. Why is it a little more difficult to catch up with the high pitch than the low pitch? Because when you start your swing, your hands come down, and then you got to get your hands up above the ball again to make contact. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that much time on a 90-plus or 95-mile-an-hour fastball to get your hands back up there. The bat always has to be above the ball when you make contact. Eye for a ball. It's one of the first things Jim Lemon, who was a teammate of mine back in the 60s, uh, when the pitchers took batting practice, he'd always say, kid, keep the barrel of the bat above the flight of the ball. Yep. Your hands and the barrel of the bat. Pitchers would judge hitters in by if a hitter was a flat bat hitter, he laid that bat on his shoulder, he could hit the high ball a little bit better. But most of them now with that bat in the vertical position, that tells you they're low ball hitters. As uh, Williams has it that way. See, now that, that's going to be another challenge this year for Mariano is he has the reputation of that high fastball. Mm -hmm. And last year, just about everybody committed on it. And I'm sure this year, now that everyone knows who he is, they're going to say you got to lay off that pitch. There it is. Williams didn't lay off that one. Counts full. Stairs at first. And the Giambi at second. Williams didn't think so. But Tim Welke rings him up on strikes for the second out of the ninth inning. Well, once again, the fastball up. He went around much too far. Welke made the call himself. He didn't need any help from the third base umpire, Darrell Cousins. So another strikeout, another high fastball, and it'll be up to Tony Batista to keep things alive for Oakland. Doc Gooden pitched five and two-thirds innings. Control was good. He served up a couple of long balls. <laughs> Here's the high fastball waved at by Batista. Then Brian Bowringer did a nice job in two innings. Just one hit, one strikeout to set things up for Rivera. Two. Looks like he's starting to get loose. Yeah. Plus two out, two strikes. I was going to say, plus that shadow's not helping Batista at all. Struck him out. Went right up the ladder with him, and Mariano Rivera has nailed this one down for the Yankees. They even their record. Two and two. Not a clean ninth inning for Rivera, but effective. You see your totals, the Yankees with 10 runs, 13 hits. The big blow was Paul O'Neill's grand slam homer back in the third inning. Stay with us. We'll be back at Oakland to wrap this one up right after this. Yankees win it 10 to 5. The following is a rebroadcast of the Coors Light MSG Sports Desk. Coming up next, the bases were loaded and so was his bat. Paul O'Neill gets an A for effort against Oakland. Upon further review, the Mets still can't find the error of their ways. Offense also a problem today at Candlestick. Plenty of water at the Omni, and the Knicks were thirsty for a road win. The Islanders are running out of games to net points. The Lightning looking to strike at the Coliseum. Boomer is heading back to Cincinnati. He'll put that TV career on hold. And the Metro Stars look to win one in our nation's capital. It's all next on the deck.
Welcome to our late edition of the Coors Light MSG Sports Desk. I'm Deb Kaufman. Coming up on the show, we'll stack up the standings in the Eastern Conference on and off the ice. Where do the Knicks stand after tonight's game? And where do the Islanders sit after their game with Tampa? But first, the day in baseball, and the Yankees are firmly planted at 500 after their first four games of the season. Doc Gooden gave up five runs, including a couple of big home runs, but his first game was a successful enough outing. He got plenty of run support, and the Yankees win it this afternoon 10-5. to They scored six in a huge third inning to give Doc plenty of breathing room. We had the game for you this afternoon on MSG, a beautiful day for baseball at the revamped Oakland Coliseum. Nothing beautiful about this for Doc in the bottom of the first. Jose Canseco fights one off. He singles to center field. Tony Batista comes around to score, and it was 1-0 A's. But the Yanks tie it up in the bottom of the third with runners on first and second. Bernie sends one between short and third. Derek Jeter, who had a busy day, comes around to score, and that tied it at one. And after a Tino Martinez sacrifice made a 2-1, Paul O'Neill just crushes one, and he knew it right away, head down on his way to first. It came off of Mike Mollers for the Grand Slam, the third of his career. It was 6-2 Yankees. And Doc needed all of the five-run lead. He gave up three home runs. Canseco, Geronimo Barroa, and Scott Spezio all hit one out. And that made it 6-5, that last one. But five is all that Doc would give up. And the Yankees got some insurance in the eighth. Bernie single. Derek Jeter scores again to make it 7-5. So for Joe Torre, finally an opportunity to bring in Mariano Rivera. And Mariano came in with one out in the eighth, and in the ninth, he finished with a flourish. Striking out Spezio, George Williams, and Batista with plenty of high heat. Rivera gets the save. He's one for one in that category. And the Yanks win this afternoon. They are back on MSG tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. What a wild game played in Chicago today. The second longest nine-inning game in baseball history. 27 runs were scored. The Tigers win it in a pitcher's nightmare, 15-12. to 12. If you remember, the Yankees and Orioles set the record on MSG last spring. But this one was plenty long, four hours and 20 minutes. Chris Snow. Because the facts are in on Titanic.